This time on Rad Rat Video, we're talking about how they should do DLC for the new Tony Hawk game and quite a few other questions. Let's do it. Welcome back to Rad Rat Video, a channel about skateboarding and answering your skateboarding questions and playing skateboarding video games and building skateboard stuff every now and then. And today I'm answering a few of your questions on this series, Ask Rad Rat. A couple weeks back, I asked for questions because I was running low and you guys definitely came through. I got a ton of stuff. Uh, today, I think we're answering six different entries. First one is from Ivan, who says, hi. I am new to your channel, and now my son and I can't stop watching. Excellent content. My question is regarding the worldwide fingerboarding scene. What do you think about it, and have you ever given it a go? You may need a full video on how this scene has gone from standard plastic tech deck toys to a full-blown culture. Thanks for everything you do. So um, I am not doing a full documentary thing, but it might be more interesting for you anyway just to hear about my history of it. Um, so when I was in about eighth grade, I think, which would have been maybe 2001 or so, tech decks were super popular. Everyone had one. Every kid had a tech deck in their pocket all the time. At least all my friends did. And they could all do, uh, they would all, you know, in, in uh, math class, when the teacher's not looking, the teachers hated them because of how much noise they made. Whenever the teacher's not looking, you pull it out real quick and you try to do like a 360 flip, 360 flip. You just kind of throw the board and hope and try to land it in a manual on your book and, and stuff like that. And we would have so much fun with this. And uh, during during lunch, we'd all have our tech decks out and be playing. And there'd be a kid who'd come in with the, they had like a uh, carrying case and you would open it up and you could hang all your decks on it and you'd have buckets for all the different colors of wheels and trucks and like the skate tool and all that kind of stuff that you could bring around with you. And they were super popular. Um, I remember one of the kids had uh, like a, he made a wood fingerboard, but it was like, he didn't like make it with plies and, and glue it like a, like a skateboard. He just kind of like cut it this was in like in shop class. He just like cut the angles and everything and made like a wood fingerboard. And I ended up with it somehow. I think he gave it to me. And I, I would take that around instead of an actual tech deck because there were no wheels. So it wasn't as loud because with a tech deck, if you do tricks, the wheels like kind of shake and it makes a lot of noise. So you just, I would just have this little wood board and I would be at a friend's house and I just pull out my little wood fingerboard and like do a lip slide on their countertop and then put it back in my pocket. Absolutely loved it. And in fact, uh, I made videos and I got a sponsor back in the day. This was maybe 2008. I'm assuming because you see a phone that I have in, in, uh, in one of these videos, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna play one for you right now. So I had a YouTube channel at the time for skateboarding and I did skateboarding trick tips and stuff like that. And I also had a uh, channel for my, my pro fingerboard videos. And uh, I don't think that channel exists anymore. I never took it down and I always used copyright free music. So I don't think it would have gotten taken down either. I just don't, I think it's just so low in the search results that you can't find it anymore. But yeah, I'll, I'm showing you some of this stuff now. I had a, a sponsor, it was a brand called Pure. And I think it was just some kid, just like me, you know? You know, I was, I don't know, 18 and this was just some guy and he would send me a board every now and then and I would put his name in the description of these uh, videos while I was doing them. And I had so much fun with it. Uh, it was just, I mean, it's just like skateboarding just without the potential to get hurt at all. Um, but at that point, as you can probably see, I mean, I had a, a wood fingerboard sponsor. Uh, I was kind of beyond the tech deck stuff. So there's lots of brands at the time. Um, they still exist now, maybe not the same brands, but like there are still brands that exist. You can get wheels that have, um, that spin well, because there's a, a bearing built into them. You get trucks that can actually turn. The original tech deck ones were just solid. Like they had a bushing, but it was just plastic. So like the truck had to be super tight or it would just fall apart. Um, and you get foam grip tape and you can do all this kind of stuff. And you could have a full fingerboard that did not have a single tech deck part on it. And if you did, it was better. So there were different companies at the time, different uh, sites you could go to and forums and everything. And I remember buying a video uh, back in the day. It was like pre YouTube, I think. So you couldn't just like put a video online. I, I had to buy a video and they sent me a download link 
for a video. I, I, I'm trying to remember what it was called. It was just some guys in their bedrooms, like doing tricks on, you know, rails and skate parks and stuff that they built. And it's, it, it, it was fun. Um, and recently I was at Target and I found this. Um, this is a tech deck. Um, it's made of wood uh, that used to say tech deck, but it rubbed off immediately. I replaced the, the bearings with some of the old ones I had. Uh, and like, it's much better than anything I ever had as a kid. It's, it's much bigger. So it's easier to like do one flip and catch it as opposed to the really small ones where you do like a quadruple flip every time you try to do anything. It's got the foam grip tape. That's what the professional fingerboard stuff. I don't think anyone's a professional fingerboarder, but you get what I'm saying. Uh, the foam stuff that that they would have, and this is really good. The trucks actually turn, and like, yeah, it's 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 a ton of fun. So I have a lot of experience with fingerboarding. I still do it all the time because when I'm at work, I'm there at my desk. I work from home. There's no one to annoy with it. So I'm thinking something through and I'm just doing little grinds on a, on a little box that I have up there. And yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. So, okay. Next question is from Julian who says, what's your opinion on seeing the same standard tricks in almost every video part, like 360 flips, kick flips, nollie flips, so on. I know my opinion is quite extreme as I find it pretty boring to see these over and over again. I'd like to see more variation in even what people call ugly tricks like heel flips, pop shove or even grab tricks and street parts. Keep up, keep doing what you're doing. You're awesome. Well, thank you. Um, I used to agree with that a lot more strongly than I do now. I do still think you're right. Just maybe not quite to the level um, that you do. So there was a clip recently, it was on the barracks. It's a guy doing a 360 flip. He does it super high. And the caption was like, this is the highest 360 flip I've ever seen. And it was huge. It's just a really cool 360 flip on flat. And I was thinking like, he has so much air time that if he didn't catch it, he could have done a 540 flip pretty easily, but it wouldn't have looked good, you know? So for the 360 flip, it comes around, he catches it about at the peak, maybe like slightly on, on his way down, catches it and then, you know, brings it down to the ground. If he, if the board was coming around and he just pulled his feet up and held them up and up and up and up and then caught it at the last second, he could have done a 540 flip. It would have been a really high 540 flip. It would have been pretty cool, but it, it wouldn't have looked as good. You know, the standard tricks are standard because they're really good tricks. You know, a 360 flip, it spins and it flips once each way, right? So it kind of like folds in around itself and it comes around right as the spin is finishing, the flip is, is finishing too, and it just got a good flow to it and it looks really good. So there's a reason why that trick is so popular and such a standard trick for everyone to do. So if you were to make a, a, a part, if you were filming for a part and you were trying to avoid all of the standard tricks, you're gonna be doing awkward and weird looking stuff. That's just kind of how it is. Um, now that said, I do agree that seeing the same stuff over and over and over is pretty boring. Back in the day when you would buy a skate video on a tape or a DVD and you would sit there and watch the whole thing and watch every part, um, like every flat ground line had a 360 flip in it. Unless they were gonna try to do the next trick switch, uh, then it would be a front side flip. Or if they landed switch, they might do a switch front side flip and do the next trick uh, normal. But it was the same couple of tricks and it's like, okay, I get the point. Now you don't really watch an hour long video at once, you know, and trying to just do unique stuff all the time doesn't necessarily, isn't more interesting. So I get where you're coming from, but uh, I don't know if I agree at this point. So back to that huge 360 flip, if he did a 360 double flip, would have been more interesting as far as, you know, something you don't see as often would have been more technically difficult, but it probably little would have looked, it probably would have looked worse. And that's an important thing. That's something that I am understanding more and more as I get older, like the style of something and the way that you make it look is more important than how it is on paper. Um, that was always the way I used to skate. Like if I could cross this trick off and say I've done it, then that's a big accomplishment but it's more of being able to do a trick really well, you know? Okay, the next question is from Lyle, who says, do you have any skaters you look up to who aren't or were never sponsored? Someone like Johnny Lee County. 
Lately, I've been tired of basic Instagram edits consisting of trap rap and a bunch of zoom in shots during a landing and decided to check out some classic footage of unknown people, homie and skate videos. Stumbled upon a bunch of videos from the 2000s of skaters doing their thing on the streets. One guy I'm really fond of is a guy on YouTube by the name of Turbo Mechanoid. Hasn't uploaded anything in 10 years, but I just fall into a trance watching this guy do his thing. You, you either fall in love with the person, or the tricks, or the style. Shine a little light on all the skaters you think deserve something for their contribution to the sport, hobby, art of skateboarding. So I picked your question because I'm very familiar with this guy. Uh, I, he used to host a forum back in the day. It was all in, in French. And they would, uh, this guy and all of his friends, they would post clips as a, they would just upload a GIF into the thread and post it. So like lots of stuff, my old stuff that I posted on forums was all hosted on YouTube and it all still exists. It's not on this channel, but it's all still there. If you want to see online games of skate, like those clips still exist on the internet. This was all in a closed group in French, uh, in as GIFs. So you had to be signed up to even see them. And I spoke just enough French to follow along. If I tried to comment, I would take like an hour to like research the right words and Google Translate stuff and try to figure it out. My French wasn't good, but it was good enough to understand what they were talking about most of the time anyway. And so, uh, yeah, this kind of stuff that they would do, they invented tons and tons of crazy variations of stuff. Like if you could do a late half flip um, in any combination of, of a trick, they've probably done it. Uh, one trick, they called it a beta flip, I believe, was a, was a 360 pressure flip, right? But halfway through, you do a late half heel flip. So the board does a pressure half flip, late half heel flip as it finishes the spin. So like, try to picture that. It's not a good looking trick, but that wasn't the point. The point was to just do everything. Uh, there was one that was a pressure, pressure hard flip. There was a pressure half hard flip, late half kick flip. You know, like this type of stuff. I think plasma spins come from from these guys and that's a relatively well-known trick now uh the name too like if i ever talk about these tricks i try to use their original names because i believe that these guys turbo mechanoid and youp youp was another guy mr ck that these guys invented a lot of this stuff and so i want to give them the respect so i try to come, i try to use their original names if ever possible and recently on Instagram, somebody tagged me on a, a trick that they did, and they're asking what the name of it was. So the trick, oh, I've got my my handy dandy tech deck right here. So the trick was, he does like a pressure, so all back foot, like a pressure eighth of a flip or so, and then kind of flicks it forward and does a varial heel flip or a varial under flip, I guess. Um, and so like, hey, what's this trick called? So back in the day on these forums with Turbo Mechanoid and, and the whole crew, they had a trick called a uh, called a bubble and then a bubble flip. So a bubble was, you don't do the flip, you do like the quarter kick flip to a shove it. It's like a half of a front side impossible and then the bubble flip. And so I could just tag uh, Mr. CK, which one of the guys on, on the forum and just ask him about it. Be like, hey, do you remember who did this trick? It's like, oh yeah, we did that. And we did a trick called the zombie spin and we did all this kind of stuff. So yeah, big fan of those guys as well. The names that came to mind for me were Rod Marks and uh, Nate Sherwood. So Rod Marks, I mentioned him recently. I did a video and I showed some of his clips. He had a video part that came out on a, on tape and it was a small brand. I used to buy lots of videos from small brands because I was in a freestyle and only small obscure brand sponsored freestylers. But um, so he did lots of super tech stuff, lots of flip in, flip out, stuff that I hadn't seen before that I was blown away by. And I was really, I had a ton of respect for him and I really liked his part and I think it really drove me. I never was able to do half the stuff any of the stuff he did in that part, uh, but I thought it was great. He also was the first dolphin flip I've ever seen. Um, I did some research on the trick before and I talked to him directly, actually reached out to him about where did you learn the dolphin flip? Yours is the earliest I ever saw. And he says that the Gons did it um, and he just hated the trick and never wanted anyone to know that he did it. <laughs> but anyway, that's beside the point. He had lots of really super technical stuff, flips in, flips out, stuff on hips and all that. And I, I just, I ate it up. I love that stuff. And then Nate Sherwood, um, super pressure flip master. He could do anything with a, a pressure flip. So any combo you could do, 
he could do the pressure flip version of it. So he would do a 360 pressure flip, 50-50, uh, ollie to manual pressure flip out. He would do uh, pressure hard flip, front nose slide. He had all kinds of stuff like that. And I was just blown away by it because like, if he was doing the kickflip versions of this stuff, he would have gotten really popular, I think. Because he was really good. It wasn't just tech. He could also, he could ollie really high stuff. He would ollie over like a flat handrail and land in a manual. He could do really good, like serious street stuff. It was just always pressure flips. And pressure flips weren't cool at the time. Now I think that no one really cares as much anymore. But uh, he also did a, a trick, one of his, his big ones. He did a big spin pressure flip fakie nose grind that he did a, a couple of times. Like really cool trick. To do that with a kick flip, like a big spin flip, uh, fakie nose grind at that time would have been a pretty big deal, I think. But yeah, so I think that he was one of my influences too, because he was just doing his own thing. And this kind of ties into the last question about the style and doing standard tricks versus not. I think with Nate insisting on doing pressure flips only instead of kick flips and heel flips, that that kind of held him back. But um, yeah, like I, they looked good. There was nothing wrong with the trick. But I think 360 flips look a little bit cooler than 360 pressure flips. And maybe that's all that it really takes. So, I don't know. Uh, let's get into the next question now. This one is from Superfly Jake 422 He says, Love your videos. I was wondering, since we've seen both Skater XL in session, and how they lack a lot of mechanics you can find in Skate 3 or even Skate 2, is Skate 4 going to come in king and blow these two out of the water? I've been playing a lot of Skate 3 because I can't bring myself to pay for these unfinished games. I think they probably will get blown out of the water by Skate 4 because if you haven't played Skate 3 uh, in, in a while and you've been playing Skater XL or the session uh, early access, go back and play Skate 3. It feels flawless compared to those. Like There's nothing weird going on. You don't fall through the ground. The only glitch that comes up fairly often if you play it is every now and then if you do a hard flip, you just stop or, or you slow down a lot. So you'd be like flying up to a gap. You start the hard flip and you just do it stationary at the end. I don't know why, like the board dips through the ground and it makes you stop. I don't know. But aside from that, everything feels really good. The city that you skate in is really big. Uh, it feels more, more, I don't know how to, like there's more depth to it, like actual height. You can bomb a hill and get a ton of speed and then come over here and hit this really small kicker. But since you're going 40 miles an hour, you fly way over there. Like there's a lot more to do and there's a lot more going on. There's people who are there. There's different kinds of, I mean, there's a story mode and there's challenges and there's different types of events. There's an online mode. You can upload your clips to, I mean, you wouldn't do this anymore. You can, I did it uh, like a couple months ago. You can record clips and upload them to the skate reel if you want. They compress them down to like 240p, it looks terrible. But you can, uh, and there's all kinds of stuff that you can do. There's all you know online modes that you can play with your friends, and there's just a lot to do in that game. There's characters, there's people who talk to you, there's stuff that happens. Um, there's just a lot more in that game than the new batch of stuff. Now, the new games are made by small companies, and Skate 4 wouldn't exist if there wasn't so much interest in these new games. So, you know, you got to show some respect for that. And I've had people say, like, I'm not going to buy Skate 4. I'm only going to support these guys who are there for skateboarding. And, and I understand all that. And I don't disagree. But if you're just going to put the games next, you know, side by side, and you give someone a controller who doesn't know anything about the history, doesn't know anything about skateboarding, you give them a Skate 4 and Session, Skate 4 is probably going to be great. Like, I, I don't know. They could still blow it. But even if they just made Skate 3 again with a new city, it'd be really, really good. <laughs> the only reason I don't play Skate 3 anymore is because I've skated every inch of that city. Um, and it's just a little bit, it's a little bit played out. But if you have the Xbox on the, the X, you can, there's like a 4K enhanced mode. So like it looks good. It looks just as good as Skater XL, honestly. Um, so yeah, like... It's, it's a great game, and I think the new one will probably be great, too. Um, time will tell. We haven't seen anything of it as of this recording. But The next question is from Morg. Uh, he has a question regarding bigger boards. I used to skate an 8.5 shot board back in the early 2000s, and I always preferred bigger boards when I could find them. I think it's cool people are skating bigger boards now and bigger wheels. I think it probably has a lot to do with the progression of trickability. 
I saw in Bastian Salabanzi's Nine Club interview, he talked about skating a bigger board, 8.25 or 8.5, I believe, during the making of Sorry, and I think he may have might have influenced a lot of younger people to skate bigger boards. Do you remember anything specific about the time frame for the transition to bigger boards and why it occurred? Um, okay, so I kind of don't because Sorry came out in I think 2009 because um, there was Sorry, there was Really Sorry and Extremely Sorry, and I was there for all that stuff. And then bigger boards happened when I was away from skateboarding for a while. So around 2012. I got a job that was really far away from home. I had to drive an hour and a half each way. So I left in the dark. I got home in the dark. I lived in an, an, uh, in an apartment. Uh, no skate parks around. The parking lot was unskatable. I just kind of stopped skating for years. I, if I did skate, I would use my freestyle board. It was just the same one I always had. So I wasn't buying new boards. So from about 2012 about 2015 i think maybe like late 2015 maybe even in 2016 before i bought a, a board again a, a street board and so i was skating a 7.625 and i tried to buy a new board <laughs> in early 2016 and they do not make 7.625s anymore uh it was like eight or bigger and that was it so it happened sometime in that range it wasn't i mean sorry may have inspired to a degree but it took years to happen at least so if you remember more about that put that in the comments yeah it, it was it was a big shock to me that was the biggest change in skateboarding um you could buy the same size and hardness wheels uh same truck brands for the most part um and then like boards were just much bigger and i was really surprised <laughs> didn't know what to do so yeah i wasn't really there for that but uh let me know if you were in the comments okay the next question is from pj who says if they were to make dlcs for tony hawk's pro skater one and two how would you want activision vicarious visions to handle them personally i would prefer a reboot of the series opposed to a bigger dlc like a pro skater 3 expansion one and two already has plenty of replayability i wouldn't mind some cosmetics for my creative skater and or dlc pros curious to hear your thoughts maybe a dlc wishlist so this was this came in a little bit before they announced they did like crash bandicoot stuff so you could get like shirts and boards that are all crash bandicoot inspired um and they they made it made it so you could reset the tour mode and replay it because the way that it shipped you could play through the game once and then you were basically done you could do the uh you could go back and play as the other characters to find the stat points but the goals would not reset and that kind of sucked and i they were there's a speed run mode that kind of replaces it which i which i was okay with i would have preferred to be able to reset it then and they finally let that happen so that was a nice thing for them to add in um, I would be fine with any kind of DLC that adds in modes because, again, like you said, I, I wouldn't want them to try to expand on the game. They can't add new levels because it's based on Tony Hawk 1 and 2. So if they're to make new levels, um, I guess they can make like another tour that's all new stuff, I guess, but that's kind of a big thing. That's like half of the game. You know, there's Tony Hawk 1, Tony Hawk 2. If they made another one, that would be a pretty big DLC. I'd be surprised if they did that. But I, I also want them to hold back Tony Hawk 3. So I've talked about this before, so I won't go into detail. But my theory about the best way to continue the series would be for the next game to be Tony Hawk 3 Plus. So they'd make Tony Hawk 3, and then they'd make a new game. You couldn't do Tony Hawk 4 because the gameplay style is so different. So you would make a new game in the place of 4, and that would be the sequel. So I don't want them to try to release Tony Hawk 3 levels right now. I want them to hold that back for a sequel. So for the DLC stuff cosmetics are fine give me all the designs and t-shirts and hairstyles and all that stuff that you want i'm not going to use them i don't care so whatever like put that stuff out there i think the bigger thing would be create a park stuff the creative park is pretty good i've played some of the levels that people play i'm not into building stuff for myself really but i've played stuff that other people have made and it's pretty good i played the Foundry from Tony Hawk 3 like people just remake Tony Hawk 3 levels I was gonna do a video where I played through Tony Hawk 3, but it was all greatest uh, Creative Park stuff, but there's a lot that people haven't done yet, but um, Yeah, and you can pretty much make a lot of stuff, but if you could do more uh, Like you know, this was the foundry, but there was no lava in the thing that's pouring, you know, like 
you can't have as many hazards and things like maybe you should be able to and having different types of weather patterns and I don't know that type of stuff that stuff is all fine add that in there that's what a lot of the replayability is for me I played through the career a lot I played through with maybe half of the the pros because it does get repetitive playing the same levels over and over and over to get the stat points they move every now and then there's some in different places than they were last time but still, you go through all the levels just to get the stat points, and you move on to the next character, and then you got to get a gold in all the competitions sometimes. You got to do a combo with all the special tricks sometimes. It gets a little old. But yeah, to add in new modes, add in more ways to replay the game, like with the uh, new parks that people can make, I think that's all the kind of stuff that I would want. And that's more like free update type of stuff. I don't really see a DLC, like an actual paid DLC expansion to the current game. Uh, there's nothing I would want that would make the game better. So there was a game called Tony Hawk 2X. It was on the Xbox. And they it was basically the same thing. You could play through the career for Tony Hawk 2, and then you unlock Tony Hawk 1. It was backwards because Tony Hawk 2 was the newer one. Uh, it came out around the time Tony Hawk 3 did. So Tony Hawk 2 still had some excitement around it, so they, they flipped them around. But anyway, you could play Tony Hawk 2, then you could play Tony Hawk 1, then you could play Tony Hawk 2X. And there's these exclusive levels. I think there were five of them. And they all sucked. So I don't want them to repeat that and try to just put more stuff in there. And now every time you play through, you've got to play these again. And they kind of just slow you down. So I don't want any of that. I don't want them to expand on it. I just want them to refine. And uh, and that's about it. So that's my idea about that. I really hope they watched my videos and, and did the, and are planning out that Tony Hawk 3 Plus. I really want that. Uh, they also, they fixed the Nolly 360 flips. I've complained about those since the day the demo dropped. They look terrible because they were backwards. Like you start, you start the trick and then he just does like a normal 360 flip. I think Tony Hawk 4 did that and they just kept it. Um, so they still have a lot of tricks that are backwards where you start Nolly and then it just plays the wrong animation. Drives me crazy. Fix that. Priority number one, make the tricks right, <laughs> please. Um, but uh, yeah, so yeah, refine and not add, I think is what I would want them to do. Um, I think we'll see. But uh, yeah, that's it for now. If you have questions, go to radratvideo.com and you could submit your question right there on the homepage and I may pick it for a future video. If you definitely want an answer, you can submit it through Patreon. I'll either message you directly as an answer or do it in a video depending on what the question is. So that's it for now. I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.